Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Providence College. This is the fourth in a series of lectures on McIntyre's book, Dependent Rational Animals. As you recall from watching earlier lectures, uh, McIntyre has three theses that he's trying to defend, one of which is that uh, non-human animals have a pre-linguistic uh, set of reasons that they act according to. And we're in that uh, argument right now. And as part of that argument, we have looked at what uh, dolphins and other non-human animals share with humans. And then we're proceeding uh, in a three-step argument from this point. So features of human languages is what we're going to go over. And the arguments that move from premises about what language is to conclusions about the inabilities of non-human animals. And then how do these arguments bear on how we characterize intelligent activity of dolphins? So we're going to look at the features of human language in this lecture and some arguments about uh, non-human animals not having language and what that means for them. So relevant characteristics of language. Uh, obviously, uh, language has vocabulary, which includes the words, the phonemes, uh, and other expressions. It has a syntax, a set of rules by which we put those rules, uh, words together. There are particular kinds of expressions that are available in the language, so names, quantifiers, conjunctions. There are speech acts, so asserting, questioning, etc. And then there's the purpose of the language, so uh, you use words in relation to a situation in social context. So uh, I'm thinking right now, of course, of how we say good day, which often means hello, right? But it also could be goodbye. So at the uh, when Gandalf first goes to visit Frodo uh, in The Hobbit, uh, Frodo says goodbye, good day, sir, and walks into his Hobbit hole uh, as a way of saying goodbye to uh, Gandalf. Uh, so how we use the words and the various speech acts that we're engaged in uh, relates to the purpose we have for using those words. So those words don't always mean the same thing in uh, different situations. So part of what that means is that our language is always embedded in forms of social practices. So how we relate to each other through our actions, the language takes on specific meanings there. Uh, and uh, McIntyre uses a, an example of someone performing an act in a play versus engaging in that act uh, in an everyday life and how the language changes uh, according to what we're doing in those various social practices. So knowing a language entails knowing the social practices in which the language occurs. So, you know, we might look at a guidebook when we're touring Italy, for instance, and be able to ask uh, where the restroom is, but that doesn't give us all the social practices in which uh, we might be uh, speaking a particular foreign language, okay? Uh, also, a, a second feature of language is that a failure to communicate may result not from the failure of sentence formation, but from a failure to understand the relative practices. Because, uh, as I've been trying to say in the last two slides, part of those relevant practices gives us the intent for why we're using the language and the words that we're using. Okay, And this is true, according to McIntyre, both uh, for human animals and for non-human animals. So we have to be under, aware of the practice in which we're engaged in order to understand uh, the words that we're using. Okay. So uh, this leads us to a distinction between thinking versus thought. And McIntyre here is explaining uh, the work of Norman Malcolm on this issue and then giving a response to this issue. Uh, so Norman Malcolm, uh, says that there's a distinct, distinction between thinking, which may not require language, and thought. And th thought here is, um, you know, my thought right now is there's a dog standing against a tree. Or my thought right now is uh, jam cake would be good for breakfast, right? So we're talking about a specific kind of thing, a propositional statement that we're thinking at the moment. And of course, if we're Defining thought as a propositional statement, uh, then it's going to require language, as I've just uh, shown. McIntyre's response here is uh, relatively simple forward, right? Um, 
Malcolm's definition of thought is a stringent definition. And not all beliefs are necessarily thoughts in that kind of way. So we might have a number of uh, indeterminate beliefs that are not linguistically uh, situated. So, you know, we all believe that the sun's going to come up tomorrow, but until someone says it's, it's, it's not a belief that we uh, have as a thought per se, right? So Malcolm's argument only means that uh, the non-human animal does not have propositional thoughts because the non-human animal, as far as we know, does not have language. That doesn't mean that the non-human animal does not have any thoughts whatsoever. So McIntyre is drawing out this distinction and trying to make an argument and a place for the non-human animal within that distinction. This leads us into four arguments for why non-human animals do not have beliefs. The first two arguments come from Donald Davidson, uh, a relatively uh, important philosopher of the 20th century. His first argument is that the attribution of belief, so saying that someone has a belief or some uh, organism has a belief, requires an ability to interpret language. So if we want to say that uh, a dog has a belief, we have to say that the dog is able to interpret language. And second, he says that uh, in order to have a belief, you must have the concept of belief in order to as uh, ascribe beliefs to others. So having the concept of belief is important because it allows us to understand the possibility of being mistaken. Uh, so there's a picture there of George Costanza from Seinfeld, uh, and he's eating an onion. Uh, and this is uh, during a period where his uh, regular glasses are broken. He's obviously got these uh, 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 goggles on, but he, he wasn't using them when he got into the uh, refrigerator. He picks an, up an onion and starts eating it. And someone says, you know, George, that's an onion. And George says, yes, it is. So did George have a belief that he was grabbing an onion rather than an apple? Uh, and immediately after this scene, of course, he spots a dime from 10 feet away. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a funny scene in that sense. Um, when we attribute belief, do we need to interpret the language that someone has? Do we need to interpret George uh, in grabbing this onion uh, and think that he's mistaken? Does that require us to say, to interpret any kind of language that he might have? Uh, Davidson would say yes, and we'll look at some counter examples in just a moment. Two other arguments, one comes from Stephen Stitch and, Stitch, and he says we must be able to distinguish between different concepts. So we have to be able to distinguish between the concepts of dog, animal, mammal, uh, or between uh, dog and book. And then uh, Searle believes that the capacity to hold belief requires a capacity to distinguish between believing, supposing, guessing, guessing and hypo hypothesizing. Uh, only language allows these kinds of distinctions, right? So I might believe that there is um, uh, life on other planets, or I might just be guessing that there's life on other planets. And that, that are, that's two different things. So I can only make that distinction uh, if I have language. So again, here with the, the same with Davison, we're drawing out distinctly distinctions uh, in different areas, whether it's concepts, the use of language, believing, supposing, etc. And we're saying it requires language to do these sorts of things, to, to make these kinds of distinctions, and non-human animals can't do them. So non-human animals do not have beliefs, right? Because they don't have these languages. So McIntyre begins by responding to Davidson and Davidson's first argument. And he says, yes, only language empowers us to reflect upon the truth or falsity of beliefs, right? And so uh, to remind ourselves, right, uh, Davidson had these two arguments that we have to have an ability to interpret language, which of course is important for deciding whether someone is being true or false, right? And so when George says, yes, it is, do we know whether he's being true or false uh, about the onion or not? So, He's agreeing with Davison, McIntyre is agreeing with Davison that language empowers us to reflect upon the truth or falsity of beliefs, but he says what Davison misses is that there is an elementary distinction between true and false beliefs that does not require language, right? So we don't have to know that George made a mistake 
right, that he had a false belief about what he was pulling out of the uh, refrigerator in order to know that he had a belief, right, or that to even make a distinction between true and false, right. So there is a pre-linguistic capacity, according to McIntyre, to change immediately due to perceptions of changes in the world, right. So uh, he brings up the example of a dog who uh, goes from one tree to another because the dog has changed his belief about where the squirrel is that he's chasing, okay? Uh, and that's a pre-linguistic capacity. We see the dog change his behavior, which means that the dog has different beliefs, okay? Uh, there's a continuity then for McIntyre between the pre-linguistic and the linguistic in human beings. And part of what McIntyre is arguing through this chapter and the next is that human beings begin with pre-linguistic beliefs and those pre-linguistic beliefs stay with us uh, throughout our lifetimes, right? Because what they do is they provide matter for reflex reflection and application of the concepts of truth and falsity. So there are many ways in which we act on an everyday basis where what we're doing is we're acting on beliefs, but those beliefs are pre-linguistic. We're not walking down the street to the grocery store uh, to get a bottle of water because we believe the water's there. We're just walking to the grocery store to get a bottle of water, right? So there's a pre-linguistic activity going on there. So this means that uh, all of these approaches, according to McIntyre, show that in some particular respect, we cannot ascribe to non-language using animals beliefs that have the same kind of determinacy, determinacy that the possession and use of language makes possible. But that doesn't mean that we can't prescribe any beliefs to animals, right? So language allows us to get very determinate about what our beliefs are in ways that we're not always determinate in those beliefs, okay? And that's a, a, an advance for uh, human life, but it's not something that just arises sui generis. It evolves out of our capacities for pre-linguistic beliefs. So what humans share with non-human animals, we can map similar distinctions in a rough and ready way, right? So he brings up this example of the cat chasing the shrew and eating the shrew and never eating the shrew again because the shrew tastes terrible, whereas the mouse tastes great, right? So the cat makes a rough and ready distinction that we can map similarly to other distinctions that human beings have. There is also perceptual investigation and attention that play much the same role between many non-human animals and human animals. Of course, uh, various non-human animals may not have perceptual investigation, may not have that kind of attention, but many do, uh, whether we're talking about mice or we're talking about dolphins or dogs, etc. So we know, for example, the dog chasing the ball has a perceptual investigation. And if you pretend to throw the ball and hide it behind your back, the dog is looking, right? He's investigating with his perception. And so he's trying to figure out what, what his beliefs are without putting it in linguistic way, right? And he pays attention uh, to what you're doing. Many of our beliefs are indeterminate, right? So it's a first step in making the belief precise to recognize that our belief is indeterminate, right? So if we think something is uh, is wrong with someone, right? We say, oh, is there something bothering you? And then we try to articulate why we think something is bothering someone, right? Is it because usually they come in and say good morning and they didn't do that this morning? Or is it because they're using uh, curse words? Or what is it that's, uh, that's changed that gives us a pre-linguistic belief that's indeterminate for us? And then uh, beliefs, linguistic and pre-linguistic, pre depend on the stock of recognitions, identification, to discriminatory classifications that we share with non-human animals. One such uh, classification is predator versus prey, right? And many animals make that distinction, uh, even though it's pre-linguistic. And we also make that distinction, oftentimes uh, pre-linguistically. All right, so how are human and non-human beliefs like? Some human beliefs are indeterminate, just like many animal beliefs are. Still, we rely on the same recognitions and distinctions that we did before we were linguistic. So big and small uh, were ideas that we shared when we were children, even though we didn't have linguistic words for those. And then adult human belief develops from and depends on what modes of belief and activity we share with some intelligent non-human 
animal species. And that's important, right? Our beliefs and our ability to have linguistic beliefs arises out of that child belief and not